great age of biodiversity discovery was in the 19th century. And it started off with images like this on the great sailing ships of the day that crisscrossed the globe. And aboard these ships would have been naturalists who were going off seeking out new and interesting species from what at that time would have been far off distant places and distant lands. There we go. They used the technology of the day to um, in seeking out new species. They used the rifles, their insect collecting nets, their nets, their or bearing presses, and they brought back myriad of specimens, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of specimens, back to the newly created natural history museums, many of which are still in existence today, which were founded in the 19th century. And it's these places that acted as depositories for those specimens where they could be stored, studied, and examined. And sure enough, in these museums today, many of those same specimens that were collected back from this time are still in existence and still in use to science. The effort to catalog global biodiversity actually began about a century earlier with this man. This is Carl von Linné, sometimes more commonly known as Linnaeus. And Linnaeus did a number of things, but one of the things that he did is lay out a system that we could actually start to try to understand biodiversity in all its myriad of forms. And perhaps his most important legacy is he gave us the idea that every species should have a Latin binomial. Every species should have a unique name that consists of a genus and some sort of descriptive name, an epithet associated with it. So because of Linnaeus, we have things like Acer rubrum, which is the red maple, causes lots of allergies earlier this year, right? Phyllis Leo, the lion or Homo sapiens, us. Now, Linnaeus and his students described about 10,000 species of plants and animals and other organisms in their day. And Linnaeus figured that was pretty much close to all the species that there were on Earth. But what became very obvious to scientists by the close of the 19th century, the close of that great age of biodiversity discovery, was that we weren't even anywhere close. This is just a graph showing you the number of species that accumulated over time, new species discovered just for Europe. That red line is the beginning of the 20th century. You can see the accumulation is still going up and up and up, about 50,000 species just from Europe. And the same sort of graph would apply to any part of the world at the time. So what I'd like to contend to all of you tonight is that the age of discovery is not over at all. In fact, we are in the second great age of biodiversity discovery. And it's a really exciting time to be out there looking at the natural world. It was ushered in by something we don't think about anymore in 2016. Right? Commercial jet travel that really began, sort of scheduled regular flights that began in the 1950s in earnest. And so now, rather than great sailing ships, the biologists will get aboard an airplane and go some, to some place to look at various bio, biological phenomena. But there's other things driving this second great age of biodiversity. And a lot of it has to do with technological changes. One of them is our ability to actually describe species, to actually look at all those little individual things and, and enunciate what they are and provide people images of them has changed tremendously. What we have up here on the left, so I'm an ant biologist, so that means I study ants. These, these are really weird ants, probably things you may not have seen before, but on the left here are, um, these are uh, images taken from a light microscope with a camera asserted to them. It takes dozens of little images and a computer program merges them all together and you get these high resolution, high magnification images. On the right there are scanning electron micrographs. These are pictures taken with scanning electron microscopes that can provide incredible magnifications. The kind of magnifications that scientists back in the 19th century couldn't even have dreamed of seeing. So these images, which may have taken a day or two to draw by hand or paint with, um, with, with some sort of um, watercolor or something, you can do in my lab in about an hour. So there's another great technological change that's changed the way that we look at biodiversity. And it's actually sort of a wash all of biology. And that is the molecular revolution, right? We're in an age where all over biology we see a, G, C, G, and T's, the little base pairs that make up the very genetic code of life. And this technology allows us to do a 
many, many different things that we never dreamed possible. And to just give you a little bit of a personal anecdote, when I was a graduate student, which wasn't all that long ago, um, I did my dissertation, and my dissertation consisted of about 1,400 of these, these A, C, Gs, and Ts, these little base pairs of a little group of ants. I just submitted a paper with some colleagues where we had these A, C, Gs, and Ts in the paper, but rather than 1,400, we had 450,000 of them. Right now we can sequence whole genomes in a month, which just 10 years ago was inconceivable to be able to do. So this has dramatically changed the way we look at all sorts of aspects of biology, and it's affected biodiversity discovery. Here we see, just as an example, two species of butterfly. If you sort of look at them, right, they basically look identical. But one of the things that's become clear is this because we people can't tell the difference doesn't mean they're not different. And these two species, in fact, have very different molecular identities. They're different groups. They're different species. But just by looking at them, we can't necessarily see that. And one of the things that's become obvious is that there's a whole cryptic world just beyond our sight that's being revealed with these molecular data. So every year, right now, about 15,000 new species of plants and animals and other organisms are described. So where do we stand? Well, in some groups of organisms like birds, right, we have a pretty good idea of how many species of birds there are on the planet. Right? We'll still find a few here or there, but we probably come close to understanding somewhat of a full catalog, although undoubtedly our molecular data will um, challenge some of that. But in other groups of organisms, take the insects, which are my specialty, we're not even anywhere close to understanding the dimension of a full catalog of all of the species. There are about 1.2 million described various species of things on Earth right now. And the estimates are anywhere that there are, are 10 million to 100 million that actually exist out there. So we're either at best, 10% of the way there. At worst, maybe 1% of the way of even understanding what lives on our own planet. But life on Earth is in crisis. Some of these crises are well known, right? We all see the, the reports about habitat destruction, whole-scale ecosystems being destroyed. Of course, we have the dual challenge of climate change, which threatens our very existence and threatens the very existence of all of life in the way we see it functioning today. And we have this interesting phenomenon. In 2010, something happened in human history that has never happened before, which for the first time in the, all of existence of humanity, more people live in urban environments than in rural environments. So just when we have these various challenges threatening the world's biodiversity, we become increasingly disconnected from that very natural world. In fact, some scientists have proposed that we've changed things to such an extent that we actually live in a whole new geological epoch that people have referred to as the Anthropocene. But there's actually a second dimension of the biodiversity crisis that I would venture probably no one in this room has ever thought about before, or maybe even heard about, which is just at the time when we need to be more focused on our ability to detect biodiversity, have a greater ability to see what's out there in nature, we are gradually becoming blind to the task. And what I mean by this is that the very people and the biological collections that support those people are under threat themselves. Various natural history collections, both at universities and, and freestanding museums, have come under threat because of decreases in funding. And there have been a whole series of articles. The Great Chicago Field Museum just laid off nearly 70% of its scientific staff. And just two months ago, the National Science Foundation, which is the only organization in the United States that's that has a program to support biological collections, suspended this program for doing so indefinitely. Whether or not it will return is anybody's guess. You may say, why does this matter? Because most of us tend not to think about biological collections. But one of the things I always ask my students in class, OK, so where do you want to go to find a new species? And the hands always go up 
go to the Amazon, go to some oceanic island, some sort of remote mountain range. I say, you can actually do it for a lot cheaper and easier than that. You can go down to Penn Station, get a train ticket, and head down to Washington. I'm not talking about the species that is commerce and things like that. What I'm talking about are going to the Smithsonian Natural History Museum, where the entomology collection alone, the collection of insects, is 30 million specimens. And within those drawers, as you sort of see here, are hundreds, thousands of new and undescribed species just waiting for someone to find them. So against this backdrop, we can ask, so is there hope? And I actually think, I, I stand before you today, we have great challenges, challenges, but I'm actually quite hopeful. There are a number of reasons that I think we can draw some hope from these problems that I'm talking about. There's no doubt, for instance, there are lots of us. One of the biggest pressures on the planet is that there are now over 7 billion of us. By 2050, there's going to be 15 billion of us on this planet. That's putting an incredible burden of all sorts of resources. But there is good news here. The overall growth rate of humanity has been declining for about the last 50 years. And by the 22nd century, we probably will approach zero, maybe even dip below zero overall population growth. So eventually, the human population will crest and begin to slowly decline. So with that in mind, what I consider this 21st century, this critical century, is we could term it, say, something like the century of the ark. The idea being that our job now, all of our jobs, is to bring as many species of living things as we can through this century, so that hopefully by the next century, by that 22nd century, we can begin to undo some of the damages that industrialization has wrought and begin the long process of restoration of natural ecosystems and restoration of various species. But we have to do it now. This is the critical bottleneck century. If we fail this century, there won't be anything for future generations to preserve. So here's a quote that I like by a fellow ant biologist, which is where he's saying the great challenge in the 21st century is to raise people everywhere to a decent standard of living while preserving as much of the rest of life as possible. Another aspect of this that I think is really important to consider is that we are all becoming increasingly disconnected from the natural world. And I think this matters on more than just a philosophical level. Of sort of, well, you know, so people don't know what a, what a certain beetle looks like, or how to identify a certain tree or a certain bird. I think it matters because we're not going to want to preserve these things if we have no connection to them. The good news is, there are lots of efforts afoot through various citizen science efforts and, and such to allow people access to biodiversity, allow people access to doing some of the science that we critically need. There are thousands of, say, just insect species here in Maryland. We could step right out here on campus, and there's projects just waiting for someone to do. Because for most species, most living things on Earth, it's important to know we know virtually nothing about them. So this is just a little experiment I did this year, of sorts. This is actually a high school student that I had work in my lab this past year. And actually, he described a new species of ant. And while that might not seem like a particular um, important thing to do, what it showed me is that you could take someone who was a complete novice, and a high school student nonetheless, give them a few tools, a little bit of training and some support, and they could actually undertake a project of, sort of describing a whole up until that point, unknown living thing. And it was quite as exciting to see. So I think one of the challenges of all, for all of us, the topic today is are you engaged, right? Is that what are the ways that you can engage to help contribute to this idea that we're in this century of the ark? What's going to allow us to take things to that 22nd century to begin the long process of restoration? The 19th century scientists such as Charles Darwin revealed to us what I feel is one of the greatest truths that science has shown to us. That we're not apart from the natural world, that we're not separate from it, but in fact we're connected to all living things through a chain, an unbroken chain of ancestors back three and a half billion years to 
to the very first living organisms on Earth. We're the only species that can look up in the nighttime sky and contemplate our own existence and indeed our own place in the natural world, in the world itself, and in the universe. We have awesome powers. We have the capacity to change whole worlds, and we're doing so. But surely it must follow that with those awesome powers comes awesome responsibilities. Thank you.